It's a Thursday on the Bold Republic radio show. That means we usually head down to Cheyenne for Wyoming Liberty Group. A rare appearance by Steve Klein from Wyoming Liberty Group in studio. And you were in town for what? There you go. Uh, I was in town for the Judiciary Committee, Joint Judiciary Committee of the Wyoming Legislature, had their second of two interim meetings. And uh, in between legislative sessions, they like to uh, go around Wyoming instead of being down right. there in the southeast corner in Cheyenne. So uh, today they happened to meet in Gillette. So uh, it was really uh, great to be up here and uh, only my second time in town. So right. uh, really great to visit. Okay, this is one of those things where uh, you and I get interested in the Judiciary Committee. But most people, I hate to say, would either be bored by it just by the sound of the name or not even know what they do. So first, exactly what is the Judiciary Committee? Well, the Judiciary Committee is uh, like so many the committees at the Wyoming legislature. They're assigned with specific tasks, most of which relate to criminal law and anything else involving the judicial system. Uh, so in this case, my uh, topic now going on two years, I've been working with that committee on uh, lobbying on the issue of civil asset forfeiture. Okay. Now, all we had to do last time we left off on this, was make a few changes to it. Because overall, am I wrong? Overall, you thought it was pretty well said, pretty good in uh, law in this country, in this country, in this state, except for a few tweaks that they needed to make. Is that right? Well, I was hoping for a few tweaks on the law that passed the legislature last session. We had a really strong committee bill that would have replaced civil asset forfeiture with criminal forfeiture. Now to step back a second, let's bring uh, the listeners up to speed. What is civil asset forfeiture? It's a, a law under which police here in Wyoming can take property that includes cash, cars, and firearms that they believe they can take it from you if they believe it's related to the drug trade. They don't have to convict you of a crime. They don't have to charge you of a crime. They don't even have to find drugs. It's a very broad law and, and one that Law enforcement has a lot of power because it right. just gives them so much. And the good news is, in our review over the years, Wyoming, unlike other states, police have and the attorney general's office have not really abused the law. In, in a lot of other states, it's turned into what's called policing for profit, where a lot of police forces are basically using this to pad their budgets. We don't really have that in Wyoming. Nevertheless, even though it hasn't been abused, the law itself is abusive because mm -hmm. it requires you as a property owner to go to court and prove the property is yours rather than require the state to prove that the property <laughs> right. is part of the drug trade. So the law that passed last session, an 80 to 9 vote before it was unfortunately vetoed by Governor Meade, would have changed that, would have said you have to be convicted of a drug crime before we're going to take the property away right. that we think is related to that drug crime. So now that law is being considered once again, but they're also considering a law that would just change civil forfeiture in a few different ways. So there's two competing bills, and I just came and testified in favor of the, the criminal bill. And uh, it's, you know, we proceed from here. There'll be one more meeting coming up in November of the Judiciary Committee, and then uh, whatever bill they decide to, to sponsor, if, if either of them, will be introduced in the February budget session. Okay, first, Governor Meade vetoed it. Why? What was his reasoning? Uh, his reasoning in his bill, in his veto letter, I should say, was a, uh, to say that because the system hasn't been abused like in other states, we have, Wyoming has passed the test. And I, you know, I say, and I, I stand by this, okay. he's right that we haven't abused it like other states, but that doesn't mean we've passed the test. That just means we failed less than other states. We really need to, to understand that if, if you know wherever you might stand on the drug war we shouldn't be doing the, uh, a reverse system basically where we're let's assume for the sake of argument we've got some open cases in wyoming right now that are pretty controversial you have a guy out in uinta county had four hundred seventy thousand dollars seized from his car that was two almost two years ago he's still waiting for his day in court mm. and we wonder you know people wonder hey what is he doing with four hundred seventy thousand dollars well, that's a very good question but there were no drugs mm. and even after a year the attorney general's office, even the federal DEA was not able to make a case against this guy, and yet we're still going after that property. So this needs to be a fundamental change. We have it backwards. Let's assume for the sake of argument that this property owner is a criminal. He's a big guy in the drug trade. Well, he's not under criminal indictment. He's not going to jail. So you're not, let's assume, again, assuming he is a drug trafficker, you're not punishing drug crime. You're taxing it. That's right. what you're doing. And that's a fundamental problem. Well, okay, let's say, and, and I think more and more people want to do this, uh, you know, as, as I just take a look at what's happening with money in America and printing more of it and borrowing more of it. Some people want, and bank failures, 
will want to put some of their money in a mattress in their house or hide it in a safe somewhere. So to ask what are they doing with $400,000, maybe they just don't trust the banks could be simply the excuse. So any of us who wanted just to squirrel away some money just in case some disaster happened, well, then we could end up having that money seized from us. But now here's the bigger question for Governor Meade, though. He vetoed it. It should have been easy to turn over the veto. What happened? Yeah, unfortunately, the, the override veto, to override a veto here in Wyoming takes a yeah. two-thirds vote of both houses. And unfortunately, the Kit bill went back to the Senate, and what started off is kind of strong. I think they would have reached about maybe 15 or 16 votes. Mm -hmm. They needed 20. Once they realized they weren't going to meet that that uh, threshold, uh, a lot of senators changed their votes, so it ended okay. up only being about 8 to, uh, what is the other, 8 to, to 22. Well, I, uh, I asked that because I heard a lot of conspiracy theories on that and uh, yeah I, you know, I didn't know what to make of yeah, it i mean i lobbied as hard as i could post <laughs> yeah. veto to, to get that override and the longer you know I, I think leadership was certainly concerned on the senate side uh, president senate senate president phil nicholas i think you know it's a it is serious to override mm -hmm. a veto and uh, again i i respect that they want to bring it back i'm really glad in the position they're at right now uh but i certainly think it was a it was a mistake certainly mm -hmm. to not override. And uh, I, I worry that the system stays in place. We've had it for 40 years. And again, it's, you know, I should add too, it's very funny that so much of this has been left up to the attorney general's office. Right. They kind of just get to make up, make it up as they go. And mm -hmm. again, all things considered, they've done a pretty good job. Sure. But, <laughs> but yeah. today, this morning, just this morning at the committee, they announced a cataclysmic change. It was like a bomb drops. There will no longer, right now, the process is they seize money. Let's say they seize a lot of money. They will send the property owner a 10% settlement offer. That's how it used to be. It was always, hey, you don't even, we're not going to go to court. We'll just give you 10% back, or you can come and prove that this property is legitimate. And a lot of people would take that offer because it costs more money to get a lawyer yeah. to go fight for it than usually the money that is at issue, right? So this is a huge change that now the AG's office is going to get very serious and say, well, no, we're not going to settle cases. If we really believe it's drug money, we're going to go and pursue that in court. Mm. That's a huge change. And it, they, again, the AG's office should be credited for that, but it also keeps begging the question of why isn't any of this written down? We really need to get our laws so that the executive off branch, like the governor and the AG under, underneath him, yeah. are enforcing the law as it's written, not as they go along. I'm sorry, but the 10% the offer just makes me even madder than what you, the, the original problem that we might have had that they have to go and prove to get all of it back. So I'm, I'm sorry that it's an insult mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, a 10% offer. Anything good come out of this meeting? I mean, are you making headway with these people? Oh, yes. I think both bills are the good news, the only good news about how long <laughs> this process has taken. We're looking at about two years yeah. that the committee, the Judiciary Committee, which the membership hasn't changed too much, has been considering this issue. So they're really well up to speed. And the questions today, you know, were very good. The Attorney General's Office, again, to their credit, presented a lot of interesting information and a lot of handouts that I have yet to go over, but a lot right. more data. And I'm, I'm, that's great. I mean, I think this is a very strong freedom-oriented committee. That's also really important to point out with chairman being Senator Christensen out of Jackson and uh, Representative Dave Miller. Uh, these are, are great legislators who have taken this issue very seriously, and they're the ones who produced the great criminal forfeiture bill last year. So I'm hoping we bring it back again, and maybe this time it gets over the threshold and, and Governor Meade might sign it this time, or if he doesn't, maybe we'll get that override veto. But it sounds to me, if, if, if I'm sorry, I doubt his honesty on this. <laughs> uh, if he vetoes it because, hey, we haven't had a problem, therefore I'm going to veto it, then why wouldn't he just veto it again? Same answer. Again, I've been very open about that we do have some problems, just yeah. because it's not like other states. It's a real problem when you have a guy who you seized, and it's not just one case. There are many others. There's also a lady who had $40,000, and she finally, after two years, is getting her day in court, I think, on August 22nd out there yeah. in Uinta County. So there's a number of these cases that just drag on and on, and due process has been blatantly thrown out the window. So we, Wyoming, again, we're not failing like other states, but right. we're failing in our own way. So I hope that Governor Meade takes a frank look at this. I hope that he's been in contact with the AG's office because they did make that huge mm -hmm. policy decision, which I think the right. governor is aware of. So obviously well, with that kind of concession, Hopefully that influences any future uh, consideration of a bill that might come come through the legislature. Well, and I wonder about the—I don't want to focus too much on Governor Meade, but he, that's a hurdle you have to overcome. Mm -hmm. So I look at Governor Meade as uh, a former attorney himself, and 
does this play into some of his decision making? Is I mean, did he have to prosecute cases like this? I'm not aware of his background. As a former U.S. attorney of, yeah. for the state of Wyoming, I'm sure his office oversaw some federal forfeitures. Mm -hmm. That's another that's a, another huge issue that the federal government, the DEA, the FBI have authority all their own. And you know, drugs. The United States Supreme Court says that you grow a marijuana plant in your backyard. That's interstate commerce, so the feds can come after you, right? right. So there's that's a whole other can of worms. And I do think. In order to be a U.S. attorney, whether you're under a Democratic or Republican or yeah, any administration yeah. ever, you have to be tough on crime. Right. And you have to be. And we saw this I mean, the Republican debates just last week. I mean, that hard line on crime, including drug crime, is not something that's really going to change. I mean, of course, now in Wyoming, we have, we're talking medical marijuana. We're talking a few other things. But generally speaking, prosecutors, I think we're, we're decades away from a, a real embracing of Maybe we don't have to, you know, do these strange half measures like civil yeah. forfeiture just to fight a drug war. So I, I think that's there, and it's always hard to reexamine where you come from. You know, we live by experience, and again, a lot of these a lot of these forfeitures, most of them, the vast majority, relate to real drug crimes. People mm -hmm. carrying hard drugs, meth, heroin. And I don't have, if you're going to prosecute them in criminal court, convict them, by all means, take yeah. away their profits. I'm, yeah. I'm all for that. Mm -hmm. So it's just that issue of when you can't establish a crime. We need to go back. This is, this is old Blackstone. I mean, he's one of the, the most, the, one of the most celebrated legal theorists. So forgive me, but this is something everyone should understand. We live under a system where it's better that 10 guilty people go free than that one innocent be in, captured. Mm -hmm. Civil forfeiture kind of throws that out the window when it comes to your property. It says, well, that's fine, but we're still going to take your stuff. Well, and I worry about, there's this little town in Florida. If you drive through, there's actually, it's on the old back highway that runs down the center of Florida. And it's called Waldo. And AAA has actually put up billboards that this is a speed trap. And if they catch you going a half mile, they don't care what your you know speedometer says on your car or if it's a little off or whatever. If they if their radar detector shows you're a half mile over the speed limit, you're going to get hundreds of dollars in fine because they found that's a great way, a revenue source for their little town. And so even though I do see a lot of very honest people in Wyoming, I worry about little towns of maybe just a few hundred people and they have to find a revenue source. And if there's a highway running through their town, this could possibly be a revenue source where any representatives there at today's meeting at all or just uh judiciary members i mean any, any house senate oh well it's the joint judiciary committee the members are both from the house and senate i don't think anyone from outside of the committee was in attendance okay i was just yeah. outside of the committee okay so uh what then do you do to convince the rest of the house and the senate well this is the the good part about these being committee bills is those People, most lot representatives, again, when you're dealing with 400 bills in a regular legislative <laughs> session, obviously, unfortunately, legislators cannot be up to speed on everything. They right. don't have the full understanding of what every bill means. So they place a lot of trust in other legislators, especially through the committee system. If you have a committee bill, it is understood that that bill has been vetted, it has been worked, and there's been input from all parties. So generally, there's a lot of deference, and I think that's that's helpful. And I mean, the good news was given that the, there was so much uh, opposition from law enforcement to this bill, that there was still on both floors, both the Senate and the House during session, a lot of back and forth, a lot of very informative uh, uh, presentation. I mean, particularly Senator Dave Kinski from the Sheridan area, his introduction of the bill was, is something I've, I've put on whyliberty.org. Actually, the audio is up there because mm -hmm. it was very eloquent and very straightforward. So I, I continue to give him credit for that. It's probably the best 20 minutes I've ever heard in the Wyoming legislature, but uh, yeah, yeah. not to offend any other legislators. But but how does law enforcement come out on this one? Did they? Uh, I mean, did you make any headway with them? Uh, they are. Uh, when it comes to the county attorneys association, the association of sheriffs and chiefs of police, pretty uniformly opposed to any kind of reform. There's a lot of uh, resistance and insistence that we're not abusing the law. It's, it, you know, and it, it's unfortunate. Uh, it's really, and I think again. The AG's office has already this this policy change we just talked about. The fact that they're supporting what's a what is a pretty good bill. Mm. It's just the problem is it changes civil forfeiture. It makes it more difficult for the AG's office. That's good. Good is the enemy of great. But I mean, like all things politics, right? You know what? You know, big nothing is also you know the enemy of good. Right. So that's going to be a big consideration going into the session. All right, Steve. Where do they find your writings on this? Well, wyliberty.org and of course pillaroflaw.org as well.